the development of the legal uh, involvement, lawyers, if you like, in the administration of sports. When we went there, there was no such thing as an in-house lawyer at a sporting association anywhere. The first person who did that was Mel Speed when he went to Cricket Australia and he employed in-house lawyers there. Before that, there were no lawyers anywhere. Um, and really the sports associate, there was no career as a sports lawyer. Hello and welcome to another Tales from the Trenches podcast brought to you by Strategic Business Alliance, better known as SBA. My name is Tony Burke. I've been a lawyer for over 40 years and I'm a long-time client of SBA. Today I'm talking to my old friend, Tony Nolan. Tony has long been senior counsel at the Victorian Bar. Tony's a very highly regarded commercial barrister and mediator and also has a long involvement in sports law. Along with Malcolm Speed, who went on to run Australian cricket, Tony set up ANSLA, or the Australian and New Zealand Sports Law Association. We'll be talking today about both mediation and ANSLA. Tony, welcome. G'day, Tony. How are you? Good to Um, talk again. I'm well, thank you, thank you. Now, Tony, we've we've known each other a long time. I, I I think we bumped into one another in the latter years of secondary school. Um, was was there something that stayed with you from those school days that's stood the test of time? Well, I, I don't think I had a very good education. I attended the <laughs> DLRL. And a lot of the teachers weren't qualified back in the 1970s, the 60s and 70s. But there was one teacher who I did have in Form 2, um, and he taught me one thing which has remained all of my working life, uh, and that was effectively, no matter what anyone says, check everything. Uh, check what people say, check underlying facts to make sure you're right, and if you think something's wrong, there probably is something wrong. Um, and that's a very important lesson which I've applied really through my whole professional career. I went to a similar school, but I have to say I have no such recollection. Um, But after secondary school, you went on to university and if I understand correctly, you began doing science. What happened there? Well, I had a great time at school because I played a lot of sport and didn't do much study, uh, (laughs) but got to... Um, and did a very, uh, well, let's say, casual, uh, v- what's now known as VCE. Um, yes. Um, uh, a lot of sport. Uh, Saturday, Sunday study was taken up by uh, watching the wrestling on Sunday morning, that world of sport, and then mm-hmm. uh, maybe watching some of the football replays on Saturday afternoon, doing about an hour or two of work before I went up and played basketball on Sunday night. Um, and consequently, the work didn't form uh, a great part of my life, uh, academic work at that stage. But it was. Uh, but I got into so I got into science. I didn't want to do science, uh, but I went to the uh, sub dean's office, and uh, the uh, sub dean at that stage, a guy called Laurie McCready, said, "Well, if you pass your science subjects, I'll let you into law." I remember so Laurie McCready. He was a great man. He was. He'd uh, suffered huge injuries as a result of a grenade injury yes. and was uh, partially paralysed and uh, blind, but was a brilliant me- uh, legal mind. I remember Laurie McCready lecturing about wills and being blind. He would stand in front of the lecture theatre and quote cases in the, and the citations of cases off the top of his head. He was extraordinary. Well, I, I, he lectured me in uh, Wills and Estates, uh, I think just before I had a knee operation from another sporting injury some years later, and he withheld my results and he, he, he said, what happened? And I said, what do you mean what happened? Uh, and he, he uh, gave me a, an oral sup uh, on the day the results came out. And he said, what are you doing here? You should have got a, an HD. And I said, I don't know what went wrong. Um, so I, I didn't have to wait around to do a February sup because I was getting <laughs> married in, in the February anyway. But that was the interesting part. 
I must say, as a, a, a student, I did what was necessary up until uh, the fifth year of law, uh, five-year course at Monash. <clears throat> I had a philosophy of uh, 49, well, you're stuffed up really badly. 50, uh, it's too close. 51, absolutely perfect. And 52, you should have been at the Notting Hill Hotel a lot, lot longer. Um, and, exactly. Uh, that kept me into good stead uh, when I was there. In fact, the the only thing the university actually taught me, I think, was uh, that law was a means to find an answer to help people out of their problems. It mm-hmm. didn't teach me anything associated with uh, how to run a business as a lawyer. No, not uh, at all. In the fifth year, I... Um, uh, as I, you know, Tony, I got married uh, at the beginning of the fifth year of university. I'm still married. Uh, and all of a sudden, my uh, 51 passes turned into distinctions and credits uh, uh, simply because I probably didn't go down to the hotel as much as I used to. So you, uh, you stumbled out of university. You had your law degree. And what did you do then? I stumbled into articles. Um, Really, by uh, a contact of my parents, who uh, who uh, uh, he was a liquidator, and uh, he knew me well because I'd played basketball with his sons, and he uh, had uh, a lunch with a sole practitioner, a guy called Tad Erlite. Um, I couldn't nice. get articles elsewhere, and Tad Erlite uh, gave me an interview of one, and I started on one day. I was driving taxis, I think, at that stage and shaved Mm -hmm. my beard off for the interview, Uh, got the job on the spot and uh, 21 days later when I started, I had my full beard back again. (laughs) I had a similar experience. I was uh, interviewed for for articles with a two-partner firm uh, who apparently decided to offer me articles, but then the partner who interviewed me promptly died and um, the surviving partner expected me to turn up one day and I didn't and then I got a phone call one day saying do you want a job and I said yes and when do you want me to start this afternoon so I jumped on the train and went straight in it was absolute chaos but I learned a hell of a lot Hmm. well I recall my first day of articles where I was sharing a very small office with uh, uh, an old-fashioned photocopier as it turned out yeah 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 (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it generated heat, an internal room, of course, uh, no windows. Um, and there was two boxes, fruit boxes on my desk full of files and involved a preference actions. And I had no idea what a preference was. Uh, and I was asked to prepare a brief to counsel. So, so, so Tony, you, you did your articles and what happened then? Did you become a solicitor or did you go to the bar? Uh, no, no. Uh, not immediately. I finished articles. Uh, I had, a, I must say, my articles were very interesting. That uh, being a sole practitioner, the mornings were spent filing documents in the titles office and the corporate affairs. Uh, afternoons were preparing cases or instructing in Supreme and County Court cases. It was very mm. unusual because uh, Ted Erlott was uh, uh, quite a bright man, but he he didn't keep very regular. Uh, file notes so that you go to a file and <laughs> nothing on there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I learned very quickly that litigation was where I wanted to be. Uh, I already knew I wanted to be a barrister, but my wife and I decided to travel for eight months. And so as soon as I graduated, I again worked bars and taxis and we went overseas for eight months, came back and was offered jobs in suburban practices, but I wanted to be a barrister. So I, so I, um, uh, went to the bar straight away. Tony, that must have been a very scary pool to dive into. Uh, it was, but um, I, I worked out during articles that I didn't think I fitted into the model of most uh, medium or larger firms of, of six-minute units and, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, timesheets and uh, performance criteria Uh, I was interested in running cases and getting to results. Uh, um, And as it turned out, my articles was ideal for that because I was given a lot of responsibility uh, at the highest level. And then uh, exposure to what barristers actually did, uh, which uh, was really what I wanted to do anyway. Mm. Um, So 
but uh, it was scary for lots of reasons. Those days, the Victorian bar was a place of expansion. Um, there were uh, there was a readers' course, but it was very uh, sporadic. One had to attend three or four uh, hourly conferences, uh, but the rest of it was being thrown in the deep end under mm. the tutelage of your master, as they were then called, now called mentors. Um, and it actually suited me, but the bar at that stage uh, uh, had uh, designated that all new readers had to go onto new lists which had been established, so you couldn't get on the oh, um, yes, yes. the famous lists. I was on uh, the remnants of a list called uh, Kelnan, which then turned into Bob Bloomfield, and um, that list ran into difficulties. The bar eventually revoked his licence for reasons unknown, um, and then I was able to transfer when he left uh, to another list, um, uh, which was Spurs list, which was a quite a, uh, an established list, and I shipped off that list when uh, when uh, 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 barristers uh, 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 list A is called uh, list A barristers was established. Uh, well, I, th- I think it had already been established, but that suited me more because the clerks didn't get me any work. You had to get your own work, uh, and um, uh, why should I pay for? Uh, 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 the work of getting work, and the clerk paying the fees for getting work when they weren't getting any work. Sure. So it was. A- let's let's go back to the beginning, though. You you would have found yourself amongst the brightest and the best. Did anyone stand out at the time? Uh, of my peers or or no, other among, barristers amongst the other junior barristers were were you were you dazzled by the people around you? Um. Well, those days were generally days in the magistrates' courts, uh, and again, um, that that philosophy which I learned at school came to play. That if you were doing a, a, a motor vehicle accident, the crash and bash in the magistrates' courts, uh, I used to go out to all of the sites and have a look to see where the accident happened to work out why the accident may have happened. Uh, oh, yes. The other people didn't go out. Uh, they relied upon the Melways and what their clients told them or what the claim form said. And I found out quite often that that was wrong. So when you want, when one, you didn't get paid extra to do that, but you, but effectively it, it gave you a leg up in preparation. And thereafter it was simply battling amongst those. Um, there was another a cabal of barristers, those who'd come in from the large firms who, went straight into the practice court or the master's court with, you know, the large cases or junior briefs. Uh, and there was clearly some bright people there, uh, obviously. Um, mm. uh, uh, but they didn't really come across my radar at that stage. I was the, at the uh, at the uh, bottom end of the market. Sure. Now, in, in the early days, there must have been times when you had zero work and you never knew when the next brief was coming from. How did you cope with that? Uh, I just took that as bar, a part of the bar life, that effectively the, your best way of, of effectively getting work was performing well in court, and then you get a reputation uh, either from your other barristers who would recommend you if you couldn't do the work, and I got a lot of work that way, or by solicitors who um, didn't know you that well but saw your performances and decided to brief you. Mm. And, and several of the solicitors who uh, were briefed me for a generation basically came to me that way. Um, that is that uh, they were appearing in the magistrate's court um, uh, and uh, uh, the ferocity of uh, running a case or preparation of the case uh, won them over effectively. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, but must... yeah, it's always dif- it's always difficult uh, because uh, although my upbringing was comfortable, my parents weren't millionaires, and uh, uh, we had a very strong work ethic. Um, your your uh, wife must have been wondering at times where the next dollar was coming from. Well, it, it was the first couple of years in particular. She was working as a teacher, and she was bringing in the income, and I wasn't. Yes. And then when we started having kids in the early eighties. Uh, 
the reverse uh, became true. I, I uh, uh, became the breadwinner uh, and effectively developed a practice. Uh, uh, the irony of it is that, you know, if you're on one of the bigger lists, you were inevitably going to get a lot more work. Uh, I wasn't there. You can't complain about that. You just have to go on and make it make it so. Uh, and then the work filters through for the upper courts, the county court and Supreme Court, and you just actually do exactly what I'd done. That is, you keep on struggling. You came across people who were clearly brighter than you. That's not the point. But but they didn't manage the facts and understand the facts as well as you did. Um, yes. So effectively, by analysis of the case, you were – you. Uh, you uh, gave yourself a, an absolute advantage. And I'll give you a simple, uh, without breaching an ethical obligation, a couple of years ago, and this is recently, but same principles apply. I was brought in, in to lead a case in relation to a very difficult family dispute. Um, and uh, my junior told me the case was hopeless and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, had to be uh, paid out to another family member. Uh, and could I amend the pleadings accordingly? And I said I wouldn't do that until such time I'd gone through the boxes of documents again, which seems to be uh, fruit boxes seem to be the, the carrier for all of these documents to find three ledgers, which actually three pages in three ledgers, which actually verified our case as our client had told us, which I was very sceptical of. And the documents was actually in the other party's handwriting. So if it was almost, uh, if I had <laughs> to write out my client's case, here it was. Um, and discovering that case uh, meant that my client didn't pay anything. Um, but effectively, the legal arguments were probably against us, but the factual arguments were very, very strongly for us. I've very, always been very strong in preparing chronologies uh, of events because when I find out when things happen, I know why they happened. Uh, and you don't know why they happen until such time as you, you work out when they happen. So you have to work through that process. Uh, one of the reasons that put me off ever going to the bar was the fear of being stuck with god-awful briefs from incompetent solicitors that would arrive at the last minute. And there must have been lots of occasions when the paperwork would arrive and you'd look at it and think, oh, my God, how am I going to make a... Uh, something salvageable out of this mess. Did that happen? Oh, it happened. Uh, well, uh, unprepared briefs were more regular uh, than fully prepared briefs. Uh, <laughs> fully prepared briefs seemed to be the, the belly wick of the large firms who have spent a lot of money preparing the cases and sometimes not very well, but at least that they've got some of the work done. Mm. Uh, so consequently, I've always found that the first thing I do is get the documents, read the documents, then hold my uh, own conferences because even though matters were scheduled for trial with weeks or months in advance, there was rarely a proof of evidence from the client. Um, so effectively, uh, it was start again. Um, um, but it must be said that uh, I, I accepted that as part of the practice of the bar um, what used to, you know, I could never be a solicitor. I could never have done what you guys had done at the profession, simply uh, of worrying, worrying about when the next client was going to walk through the door mm. and how I was going to keep the client if the case was lost, that type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, effectively, all I was there was trying to do the best I possibly could for the client. Mm. Uh, now, Tony, along the way, mediation came upon you. Uh, yep. how, did, how did you get into mediation? It's, it's not something that's usually taught in law school. Well, at that stage, it, it was never taught in law school. No. Um, and uh, it, fortunately, it is now because uh, one of my sons uh, did it, um, uh, certainly the theoretical side of it. Um, but uh, I was uh, had established a practice with sharing chambers with, with uh, two well, now judges, one's now retired, and uh, they insisted that I come along to this mediation course which is being organised by the Victorian Bar. I had yes. to come, and uh, Justice McCauley and Justice Croft, as they now are, insisted uh, that that be the case, and I attended the mediation course conducted by Bond, 
organised by the Victorian Bar. You're referring to uh, Bond, Bond University, are you? Bond University, yes. Wow. Uh, and went there with the attitude, I want, I want to know what you guys are teaching uh, my fellow practitioners about settling cases against my wishes. That is, I want to know the tricks that you're getting my clients to settle <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I was not uh, a supporter of mediation at that stage. Uh, it seemed to me that it was a knee-jerk reaction to the collapse of the legal system. Uh, we, we had in Victoria something called the spring offensive uh, whereby the courts stopped sitting for months oh, yes. because the lists were so long uh, and... Uh, all of the senior barristers, whether they were silk or not, were basically took on the role of facilitators or trying to resolve uh, the backlog because yes. um, um, it, it seems hard to believe now, but if you had a simple uh, uh, property vehicle damage case in the county court, you'd have to wait 12 to 18 months to get that case on and that's it was just a simple crash and bash you know mm, uh, mm. someone missed a red light or someone was traveling too fast or someone was inattentive which should have been sorted out but you know the, the fact that the, the delays were so long uh, meant that insurance companies were working to their advantage by delaying cases you simply just couldn't get your case on so melbourne's anyway. in, so melbourne's embrace of mediation was largely a reaction um, to dysfunction in the court system. Is that well, what you're saying? Uh, to give credit where credit was due, that uh, the then leaders of the dispute resolution bar, uh, Henry Jolson and George Golvin in particular, Bill Martin, a third oh, one, yes. um, uh, worked out in the building cases list, most of the cases were going to settle at trial and they got his honour judge Lazarus of the county court mm -hmm. uh, to institute processes of mediation. And it worked out to be a resounding success and spread from just Judge Lazarus's list, Judge Lazarus's list, uh, right through uh, uh, the Victorian judiciary, but out of the County Court of Victoria in particular. Right. And, and did you learn those tricks at the mediation course? Well, it was a bit of a road to Damascus experience for <laughs> me. It, it, it crystallised my thought processes that the legal system was basically stuffed that if you can't provide a quick and efficient method of resolution of disputes, that there has to be a better way of doing it. And that's what mediation does. And so I, uh, of the three, uh, uh, Clyde, uh, Cameron and myself who went there, I far and away did the most mediations after that because it seemed to me that sticking within the court system was fraught on failure and not in the interests of the parties. I totally agree. Um, was that the best, most practical training you've ever had in the law? Well, that was my introduction to mediation, uh, mm. and that was that was something which I adopted. Um, um, the The main thing I learned out of that first mediation course, course was active listening. Um, we as yes. barristers are. Uh, a narcissist in a way. We know everything, so you can't tell us anything. Mm -hmm. But effectively, um, teaching uh, teaching me and other attendees of the courts to actively listen to what the parties were saying, not only by the words but their body language and reactions, uh, and then trying to identify the needs, what those people wanted to achieve was a critical exercise. Um, how how did you develop skills in in reading people's body language. Was, was that part of your training? Oh, I think you picked that up as part of the cross-examination, the practical on, on course of cross-examination. Oh, yes. you, if you're cross-examining a person, if someone gives a definite yes, you can work out that. If someone gives an answer yes, there's some uncertainty there. So you work the words is the same. But the body language and the way it's answered tells you that there's more to that yes than what, what the person's answered. And if you've got an idea of what that is, well, then you can explore that. And so to, to actively listen to what's said and how it's said is a critical path of training for any barrister and I think makes better barristers. I think it 
And that's why I've been a, a strong uh, advocate for mediation training for all barristers, simply because it makes them better barristers to identify the needs of the parties. Many, many years ago, we uh, um, I hope I'm not breaching confidence here, yeah. we had, uh, you briefed me to a period of mediation involving, once again, a family dispute. Yes. Um, and, Lots of them. And, and indeed, on the face of it, it looked like a simple, not a simple, but a trust's family dispute, uh, father, step, mother, uh, daughter dispute. All of the, all of the types of disputes we're very familiar with. But our client indicated that she was most upset uh, about she didn't know where her father was. He, he'd apparently been put into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And active listening by you and I worked out that that was her prime driver that she wanted to see her father, right? Mm -hmm. the, the money wasn't important. The control of the companies, well, she didn't really care about that. She had enough money to be comfortable in the rest of her life anyway, and she had no kids and everything else like that, but she settled it on the basis that she could immediately go and see her father. So she agreed to the settlement on the basis that she'd be told where her father was. Yes, I and she left the mediation. My recollection is that she went the next day to outback New South Wales and was there and spent five days with her father. Uh, it turned out to be his last five days. Mm. And she sent me and I assume you, a great thank you note for arranging that for her, which was mm -hmm. otherwise not possible. Had I not been trained and you not been trained in active listening, the fact of the matter is that we might not have picked that up. We would have just dealt with the commercial aspects of the dispute, and that wasn't her goal at all. Um, yes, you, you've talked about some of the attributes that go to making up a uh, an effective mediator. Um, are, are there other skills that come to mind? Oh, the, well, as you know, I um, about 15 years ago, I went to Harvard to do a very short course on negotiation and mediation. Yes. A, and that refined my skills again. Um, and one of the, the critical points associated with that, apart, um, all of the you know, training exercises that they do and, um, and preparation, they gave me a two-page sheet in relation to preparation for mediation. Uh, I remember it well. <laughs> uh, which uh, effectively uh, made, and I've used it for almost every mediation that I've conducted uh, for when I'm acting as counsel for a party, to get my clients prepared for mediation, to work out what are the strengths that you've got, what are the weaknesses the other parties have got, uh, uh, what you hope to achieve, what you hope they can give up, uh, uh, what your best alternative to a negotiated agreement is. If you can't do a deal, where is it going to go? What's your worst alternative to negotiation? Um, um, you know, things like log rolling, where if you're dealing with uh, an agreement or a potential negotiation of an agreement, uh, it, there may, there's not just one factor, that's the price that you're going to get or a percentage. It may well be the area, whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive, the length of time, uh, and all of those are factors which go on price. So you might, what the, they describe in Harvard, log roll, you might go from price will be 10, 10 units, but I want two years of non-exclusive, or it might be for five years uh, for a 10% increase of price if I get... Uh, uh, effectively two areas, uh, you know, all of those things uh -huh. go in there. And effectively to work out what all of their alternatives are and get your clients to sit down and work out that before you get to a mediation is the absolute basics for making a, a, the negotiation work. That is, yes, you know where you're going. It's so huge, to educate your client, educate your client before you get there, you find that they've got a strategic advantage in the negotiations themselves. Now, on the basis of that experience, have you come to a view about whether there's a difference between the Melbourne way of mediation and the Harvard way of mediation? Well, I guess I've got to explain what the Harvard model and the Melbourne model really are. The Harvard model is that you basically get the 
parties into a table with a, a facilitator, a mediator, mm -hmm. if you like, yes. and you keep the parties talking around the table so that parties themselves do most of the negotiations. Uh, sometimes they'll break out because they want to get some further instructions, but there'll be nine times out of ten, with, uh, ten uh, in the room with you. Um, the Melbourne model is slightly different. Um, the Melbourne model is uh, developed, I think, because of the power of the barristers and the desire to keep control of the mediation process, whereby there may be an opening session uh, where everyone's present. Uh, I generally conduct them on that basis. Then the parties go into their breakout rooms and it's very difficult to get them out of their breakout rooms yes. uh, simply because uh, they want the mediator to act as a facilitator between uh, yes, yes. using a, the shuttle diplomacy as it's referred to. You go yeah. and tell them this, you go and tell them that. Uh, my view is, well, hang on, uh, yeah, I can, but why don't you go and tell the other barrister, for example, that? You know, uh, yeah, and I'll be part of the conversation, but why don't we do that? Yeah, well, I got to Harvard. Harvard said they don't believe that there is such a thing as the Harvard model, that mediation's an evolving process, but they were intrigued by the Melbourne model um, uh, and uh, the shuttle diplomacy approach. Uh, uh, they, they were surprised that it worked, uh, but experience says that it has worked because, of course, there's been... Um, Tens of thousands of cases in, in Melbourne which have settled. Any uh, views about which is the most successful? I think success is more dependent upon, sorry, to, I'm just thinking about it, more dependent upon the skill of the mediator and the mediator to adapt what's taught uh, into their practice and their style of mediation mm -hmm. so that you effectively get successful mediators. If you've if you get those who simply follow the Harvard model, they might crash and burn straight away because the resistance will be from the barristers. Or if you get uh, those who stick to the Melbourne model exclusively, uh, they're not going to be successful because they're not adapting yes. the mediation to the needs of I the agree. parties. And, I and, agree. And some mediations I conduct, uh, I tell the part, I get them back if they go into the Melbourne model. I try and get them back into the room, or certainly the lawyers back into the room as soon as possible. Some of them, uh, they don't actually ever see each other again. You know, yeah. uh, uh, that's particularly true on these days of Zoom mediations as Speaking well. Speaking of which, uh, in the last several years, we've had um, COVID and the pandemic, and scores of mediations over Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and those sorts of applications. Um, do, do they work as well? Have you had to nuance your style to, to do it differently? You miss the body language point. You can't really pick up as much body language uh, uh, electronically. Uh, uh, as you and I are talking, we we can work out what's right and not. Sure. But for people who we haven't dealt with before, the fact of the matter is it's terribly, terribly difficult. So it's... Um, it's been an effective tool, mediation by Zoom, and I'll, I'll use Zoom because I use Zoom the best. Uh, I find it the best one. But it's not as effective as face-to-face. -face. Uh, I'm fa using three models at the moment. The first is face-to-face, -face, which I encourage as best as I can. The second is the hybrid model where I might have most of the parties present in one room, but someone can't attend, they're interstate or overseas, and there'll be hooked into the conference by Zoom, and the third is total Zoom. I'm convinced that the best approach is uh, the first approach, mm -hmm. but when I'm forced to conduct Zoom mediations, uh, I now insist that the solicitors be with the yes. clients uh, in the same room, not in the same breakout room, but in the same room, physically mm -hmm. in the same room, uh, because... Um, uh, the interaction of the clients is critical to the process. Yes. You'll often see when people's on the screen, uh, they'll do exactly what I'm about to do now, and you know that they're checking their emails. Mm. You've, they've, they've, they've lost concentration in the process. If you've got the solicitors in, their room, in the room with them, you can actually ensure that there's going to be conversations about this case whilst you're out of the room, and that helps the process of discussion. Whereas 
we, 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 whereas we're all on a link, uh, you know, everyone's, oh, I've got to go and get coffee now, or I've got to go and, you know, check this or something's come up or, or uh, hang on, I'll put you on mute for five minutes, that type of stuff. And so you lose them. So you lose the yes. momentum. Tony, it often seems to me that mediation serves the purpose of an emotional catharsis and that might take several hours uh, to evolve, to be articulated. And, and once that has happened, once it's on the table, the, the journey to a resolution seems that much easier. Um, it, it gets the emotion out of the way and, and enables the settlement. A any comment? Oh, absolutely true. That um, There's a lot of claims on testator family maintenance or, or uneven wills uh, or undue pressure on, you know, you've pressured Dad to exclude me out of the will. Uh, and nine times out of ten, it's not a question of dollars. It's why did my dad prefer my sister over me? I loved him so much. I did so much for him. And he's given me nothing in the will. Uh, it's not about... Uh, the financial mm, mm. reward. It's about it's about um, the emotional reaction to the death of the family member, and not being treated as an equal yes. or inferior, yes. uh, more particularly, or being treated inferior to mm. the other. And effectively, that happens so often. Um, and I, I point out that the animosity, which is generally built up, has not been caused by any of the parties in the room, the animus was created by the mother or father who left this yes. will um, and perhaps the lawyer who actually um, failed to properly advise or prepare the will. Can I give you a simple example? If if indeed that there's uh, four children and one child is left out without any explanation, um, that that is clearly um, totally undesirable. What we really want to achieve is where the lawyer who prepares that will puts an explanation as to why the child has been excluded. Absolutely. And it might be for good reason. Um, uh, I've excluded you because uh, I sold my business to you at a cheaper rate when I yes. was younger uh, to take over. Or uh, I, I know that you've married someone and he's worth tens of millions and you don't need the yes. money. Or someone else has got a greater need. Uh, and if... If indeed the solicitor has not included those statements in the will, um, you, you can really sheet home the blame both to the to the um, testator and also to the solicitor who prepared the will. Right now, Tony. Now it's not negligent, but it's a very poor practice. Okay, um, Tony. Wrapping up the the issue of mediation, do do judges and former judges uh, perform well as mediators? Um. Only if they've done some mediation training. Uh, there's a lot of mediators out there. Um, it's a bit hard for me to, to criticise, but I've, <laughs> I've, I've spent policy. a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time uh, when judges retiring from the county court saying, "Oh, look, I'll pick up practice as a mediator," and from the Supreme Court, um, and haven't done any mediation training. They just think because they're a judge, they've got the training. Uh, because they've been good in imposing decisions and being fed facts and churning out a result. Uh, uh, that's not what mediation's about at no. all. Uh, there's some there's some who have gone on and done the training. Um, uh, some of the federal court judges in particular have, have actually enrolled in basic mediation courses run by the Victorian Bar over the, I think it's a week's course, and done all of the testing uh, with no expectation they're going to pass, but an expectation that they need to know how mediation is actually conducted because it's a totally different skill. Of course, of course. Totally different skill. Now, having said that, having said that, the, there is a role for them because a lot of the larger insurance companies and claims offices will not settle the multi-million dollar disputes unless and until the mediation's been conducted by either a, a high court or a superior court really? judge. Uh, um uh, most of the large cases, uh, large S cases, the the um, well, the bushfire cases, for example, uh, Justice Finkelstein was involved in that for a long time. Uh, several of the High Court judges have sat on uh, uh, 
uh, the larger cases, so the Great Southern case, mm-hmm. for example, in Victoria, which ran for a year, uh, there was a roving brief by one of the high, retired high court judges from Queensland. Um, as it turned out, both of those, I think, appoint, no, uh, certainly in the Great Southern, they appointed a second mediator to facilitate the processes as well. Um, but I, I'm not... I'm not really talking about that generally. I'm talking about the imposition of uh, retired judges on the general mediation population. That is the the claims which regularly come up with the courts, not the the super claims, the, the 50 million and above right. cases. Um, let's now turn our attention to sports law. Um, yeah, I should say something in your opening. I, I, Malcolm Speed and a group of others uh, – arranged the initial meeting at the Melbourne University with Hayden Opie, which was the genesis I was invited to and went to that dinner and then joined Ansel immediately after. But uh, I've got to give credit where credit's due. Hayden Opie and Malcolm Speed were the, the generators. Ian Fulliger, but, perhaps. But Hayden Opie was an academic, so I, wasn't I he? Oh, yes, but Ansley came out of the academic basis at Melbourne University. The dinner was at Melbourne University. Well, you, he arranged for the... You, you and Mel Speed had your arms, had, had your sleeves rolled up in the early days. We did. Uh, through the NBL, uh, through our connections from the bar, he was a, uh, in his younger days, was a, uh, a state representative of basketball. I was a, uh, a, uh, a weekend warrior, mm. basically, uh, uh, but we knew we were involved in the sport and... Uh, 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 we, uh, he engaged me on several of the cases uh, uh, to run for the NBL. Um, I acted in various capacities there as their uh, uh, their, their uh, investigator for for uh, uh, as uh, the tribunal member. Uh, I think for the appeals board at some stage, uh, and had long association with the NBL in its infancy mm-hmm. days um, and before its. Uh, uh, well, it collapsed twice, but before its uh, second collapse. But, but Anslet grew to be the uh, the leading sports law association in the country and in New Zealand. Yes, it did. Yes, and yes, it and did. What have been the highlights along the way? Uh, the highlights have been the development of the legal uh, involvement, le- lawyers, if you like, in the administration of sports. When we went there, there was no such thing as an in-house lawyer at a, a sporting association anywhere. The first person who did that was Mel Speed when he went to Cricket Australia mm-hmm. and he employed in-house lawyers there. Before that, there were no lawyers anywhere. Really? Uh, and really the sports associate, there was no career as a sports lawyer. That is that there were people like myself who were, you know, on tribunals and assisting sports as best as I possibly could and advising athletes as, as and when disputes came out. Um, Most, mostly pro bono? Really was a fair number were, yeah. Uh, I, 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 the Victorian Bar eventually, uh, sorry, the commercial bar of the Victorian Bar set up uh, a sports section and uh, the late Henry Jolson, myself, uh, uh, now Justice uh, Olstergren and uh, Paul Hayes were, I think, the four committee members on the initial uh, h- hearing. Henry Jolson was absolutely fantastic in setting up that. Uh, when Henry fell sick and I took over as chair of that, uh, my critical involvement was to try and get uh, barristers back involved in the sports, which they'd been interested in. They may have been weekend warriors like mm-hmm. myself or there were some AFL footballers to get AFL footballers back into uh, sport at the top level, either tribunal mm-hmm. work for the AFL, the VFL or a lot of the country associations, uh, same for cricket. Um, so in the processes, uh, I think we had 70 or 80 volunteers at some stage to get these barristers uh, to get involved back in the sports. And I'm, I'm very pleased with that. That's one of the great issues because I believe sport is better when, well, let me rephrase it, sport is a basic human right. Uh, you yes. have a, a right as a human right to, to relaxation. And if your human rights are going to be affected by uh, dictatorial statements from sports, which are very dictatorial and and, and uh, uh, fiefdom-like, mm. so we have our administrators who are very fiefdom-like, 
that's not good for sport because the participants are the ones we're there for and they seem to forget that 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 the administrators seem to forget that they think that they're there for themselves or the development of the sport well i have a view that sport can only develop uh, when you carry the people along with you and if you're going to take away people's rights not allow them to participate in their relaxation it's got to be fair uh, and uh, having been a victim of very fair un- unfair tribunals during my uh, weekend warrior basketball days i knew that was something which seriously had to be sorted out you know they were robbing our players for 10 years for a, you know, a, a fight which broke out. Well, hang on a moment. That's not right. Uh, you get rubbed out for life if you hit a referee or yeah, an exactly. umpire, but you don't if there's just if there's a brawl. Uh, uh, and that's something which I've always been interested in, to make sure that the athletes get a fair go. Yes. And most of it's been pro bono. Now, now it seems to me, Tony, that the, the, the large issue that's on the horizon in the area of sports law is that of the concussion issue? Um, I personally yep. think it will have massive implications across a, a number of sports. Where are things sitting at the moment, and where do you see they will go? I, I think um, I, I, I think that this is a general community issue. Um, the fact of the matter is that. It's proven beyond any doubt, in my view, that subconcussive injuries, which are not necessarily concussion, but multiple blows, mm. which eventually cause CTE, uh, is a major problem. Um, and we've been addressing the problem from the professional level. That is, the professional footballers working in the AFL or for, that, for rugby and saying, look what's happening to these people. Look what happened to Danny Frawley. Look what happened to to uh, Sean Smith. Look what happened to Polly Farmer. All of our champions have had brain injuries, which uh, affected them in their later lives. Look what happened to Diesel Williams, uh, who's come out with these problems. But effectively, there we have to deal with that. And that'll be a class action or class actions. I think there are currently two before the Supreme Court. They will inevitably sort out the players we can't do anything for. We have to deal with that cabal. The second cabal is is the wider issue, which actually interests me more. Well, if that's true in professional sport, what about all the weekend warriors who are out there playing mm. football uh, and all of the symptoms uh, are come home to roost? And the first canary in the coal mine is always the family relationships, the domestic violence, the wives who can't live with their husbands, the the kids who have had breakups with their parents, uh, with their kids, sorry, the breakup with their parent who was affected by these. Uh, And uh, I think it's a widespread community problem. Um, I, I have a philosophy about this. We only have one clinic at the moment for concussive children can go to the treatment of concussion industries and that's Epworth in Hawthorne. It's ridiculous to suggest that of all of the weekend warriors out there, all of the kids who have concussion on the weekend, that we don't have proper protocols for them uh, and we don't have effectively proper treatment for these kids so that um, either they are excluded from the game or they are recovered from their concussive injuries. Um, so that's another yeah. cabal. Then we have to amend the rules for the AFL. Yes. So that um, we've seen this year, we've we've had, uh, I think it's 25 players who have been rubbed out for improper tackles where the heads hit the ground, um, where a dangerous tackle. Well, let's assume that that's right. Let's assume that they are all dangerous tackles and the potential to cause injury. If that's true, it was worse last year and worse the year before, but if the numbers are the same, that means that there's been 25 players over the last 25 years. That's 450 players who have suffered or are likely to suffer concussion injuries as a result of it that. It becomes an, an and, uninsurable uh, risk, surely. Uh, unless you change the rules dramatically, mm. yes. We might have a debate about that one. Um by the way, it's it's fascinating to, to hear your views about this. I think this is a, a live issue that we're going to hear a great deal more of 
over the coming months and yes, years. Yes, I, I attended a meeting. I attended a meeting only yesterday with a group of retired AFL players who uh, want to form uh, what they call the fifth quarter, and that's effectively a a, 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 a an organisation of players who are now volunteering, basically. Either they've suffered depression or some illnesses as a result, or they're taking care of their teammates uh, who are suffering those injuries. And they want coordination, uh, firstly, coordination so that the AFL and the Players Association or some other body uh, presents as a one-stop shop so they provide direction where these people can get assistance, and psychological assistance or financial assistance or whatever the assistance is. Uh, but underlying that is the problem that uh, the AFL and the Players Association, which negotiates the players' payments, really have to set up a proper compensation system and, and so that there is a fund to take care of the players who have generated the wealth in the yes. past. Um, uh, so there's a lot of activity out there and people who are interested in this but the headline matters will change, and history says you only change when you educate the administrators to say that there really is a problem. And I don't, from my point of view, I don't accept the AFL as there yet. Um, it seems to me that we've got to have, for example, a scheme whereby if you suffer a subconcussive injury or you suffer a concussion, for that matter, you're under the auspices of work cover. Mm. Uh, Currently, our sportsmen aren't covered by work cover at all, so we've got to fight insurance claims. Right. Now, Tony, um, leaving these weighty issues to one side, how do you how do you sure. decompress? How do you relax when you get home at night? Uh, um, I, I. Or don't you? Uh, <laughs> or. Perhaps I don't. Uh, at the moment, it's mainly my family, my children, and my grandchildren are my great uh, releases. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a great football fan. You'll see my Demons uh, Premiership poster in the background there. Uh, I go to the football. I spend a lot of time talking to my doctor brother, uh, not about medicine, but about football. Uh, uh, I'm very strong on, on decompression of family. But I should say that I... I it's such a critical issue because uh, one of the joys of you we're talking about developing a practice that you took every brief that came your mm. way. It didn't mm. matter whether it was workers' compensation, uh, as it was now and then, family law, uh, uh, criminal law, whatever. And as your practice developed, you're able to exclude uh, matters. I have a belief that everyone's got an emotional reserve. And I worked out that I didn't want to waste any of my emotional reserve on family law. <laughs> and so I, I didn't take any family Fair law. Enough. And then workers' compensation cases. So that I, I, uh, the decompression is from cases where you, where you, um, you uh, don't want to do in the first place or you don't enjoy doing. Uh, but uh, the other way you do it is to not accept that type of work uh, so that uh, – and in the last year or two, especially since COVID, uh, I've fallen out of love of preparing cases for trial um, uh, and running yes. trials because it takes a lot of emotional input mm. uh, in the trial, time and energy, stress and stress levels. And I'm debating whether I'm worth it. There's a hundred other barristers, junior barristers, who are uh, uh, desperate to get the work will do a fantastic job and are prepared to take the stresses of all of that. Uh, as to whether they'll do it better, I don't know, but eventually I know that they'll do a more than adequate job. Uh, so effectively, I've, you know, I have the luxury of being able to pick and choose what I do. And so uh, I, unless it's uh, an extreme favour for uh, one of my long-standing <laughs> um, uh, backers, uh, I, won't, I generally won't go to okay. court. These days, um, Tony, uh, and mediation, it, and mediation itself is a lot less stressful. That effectively, my task for the day is whether I could or not assist the parties to get a deal. If I can't, I don't have to worry because I'm. It's not the next day. I'm not there the next day for what happens next. Uh, that's the hands of their solicitors. Now, now Tony, it's been a, a long and very successful career at the bar. Well, 
was it the right decision you made all those years ago to make a right-hand turn out of science? Oh, absolutely. And also the, uh, uh, the decision to come to the bar was the right one. I, I look back now uh, and I look at all of – I just couldn't have coped in a large firm. I couldn't have coped with the politics of the firm. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have coped with the six-minute units, uh, the necessity to generate new clients and then be have performance assessments as to profitability and then the responsibility of running a practice of employing one or 10 or 20 people as you did in your mm. practice uh, and, and converting into a mid-sized practice with all of the stresses associated with that. Uh, what university didn't teach me was the business of law. It didn't teach me the bus anything about running a business. And I'm so fortunate at the bar, we have to learn a little bit, but it's only me. It's only survival yeah. for me and my secretary, which I used to have, but she's now retired. Um, and effectively, um, that's a tenth of the, the stress and thing you have, uh, uh, pressures that you have on your life, uh, Tony, when you're running your practice. And I can see that people would say, had enough of this, I just can't do it anymore because I'm not getting the satisfaction that I want. Yeah. I, I'm not running a business. In, you know, I'm, I'm running a business I'm not doing the law anymore. Uh, you know, I'm not providing solutions. I'm providing a work environment for a business. And after all, law is ultimately a business. Yes, of course it is. It could be the big, it could be the big business of, of uh, you know, the, the large firms, or the ashes of the world or uh, whatever, or it can be a medium firm like your firm in the suburban, which was very successful with multiple partners at the end, or it can be a sole practitioner who's basically responsible for himself. But it is a business. Uh, and effectively, what university didn't teach me was anything about the business of running of a law practice. You're right. Uh, I wrote an article on that very issue for the Law Institute Journal. Oh, did you? A couple of uh, 18 months or so ago. That's all about the stuff they don't teach you in, in law school. You should, you should, ah, you well, should look it up. <laughs> I'll send it to you. I'll send well, it to you. As I told you, the only thing that I learned at law school was to find really the protocols uh, and the rules of behaviour. That is not ethics, but behaviour in community, what is acceptable or of not, uh, and what the rules are. Of course. Okay. It doesn't matter whether it's criminal law or civil law or property law, for example, as to, uh, uh, you know, transfer of property, uh, uh, you, you name it. Any of the legal norms we have are in the textbooks. They don't tell you how they apply. They just say, here's the precedent. Mm -hmm. You have to work out whether you can fit your facts into that as to what's sure. right. Now, Tony, this has been a, a, a great discussion, uh, a rare privilege. Thank you for your service to the profession. Uh, I've no doubt that there are many lawyers and clients out there who are enormously grateful to you for your search for some common ground. Um, you've saved a lot of people a great deal of pain at trial. So on their behalf, thank you. And um, we look forward to hearing of your further exploits in the time to come. Thank you again. Oh, good. Oh, thanks. I've enjoyed the conversation.